Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. So today I had the honor to invite down Master Leong and currently you can see um, based on a very nice background, we're actually quite near Sentosa. So for those of you who, who don't know Master Leong, um, he's actually also one of those avid um, um, social media influencers out there who are also all in Alibaba. So throughout the entire interview process itself, we'll be understanding a little bit more into his entire thought process um, to know a little bit more about him. And of course, ultimately um, in this video, it's not going to be just two Alibaba bulls saying that oh Alibaba is the greatest um, investment opportunity out there. So today I'll have the honor to play devil's advocate and to maybe answer some of the more pressing and burning questions out there that some of you are constantly worried about and I will be the bear in this video and Master Leong will be the bull in this video. So maybe to start off, um, Master Leong you can give us a walkthrough about your entire investment journey thus far. Oh, so I've been a value investor since 2008. So 13 years as a value investor. So uh, let me share my experience. Uh. So when I first started investing, it was during the global financial crisis. The SDI was 3,800 points right. back then. Then when it fell 30% to 2,700, I bought my first shares, 2,000 shares of the STI ETF. Because I thought, ah, oh, it's a discount already. Mm -hmm. Now finally a bear market come, I can go in. But after I bought, it crashed another 30%. So the STI went down from 3,800 all the way down to 1,600. Right. More than a 50% crash. Then okay. I had a sleepless night. Then, oh, I didn't know what to do. Then finally, there was a V-shaped recovery. Right. And the STI rebounded to 2,300 points. And finally, wow, the economy is in recession. US, Singapore, all in recession. Yet, the stock price went up. So I panicked and I sold off. I was uh, relieved to finally sell off. But that was my biggest mistake and I learned from that mistake. After that, subsequently, the STI went to 2,700 and 3,000 points. Also, uh, from uh, that, I learned a lot. Then in 2012 to 2015, I was in the US market. I invested in stocks such as uh, Apple, Berkshire Hathaway, and Bank of America. So I learned about the US market. But then I made uh, also a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistake I made was selling away all my US shares in 2015. Because I was thinking, hey, 2009 to 2015, six years of US bull market already. So a bear should be coming soon. So I should sell everything, wait for a correction, get back in again. Then in the end, the bull continued for another five years until right. 2020. So for the next five years, I was hiding in the Singapore market, so where I was more defensive. But that I focused more on value investing. But my more significant picks was in 2019. I bought a Popnex. Uh, it was a property agency. Like it IPO at uh, 65 cents. And because of the cooling measures announced, announced by the government, it fell to 50 cents. So I bought 200,000 shares at uh, 50 cents because I felt it was a great company and in the long term it will be still solid. So the cooling measures was just a short term fear only. So uh, after I bought, it continued to went lower. So the lesson learned is every time you buy, it will still go lower. Right. So it dropped to another 20% to 40 cents. Well, then in 2020, my top pick conviction was DBS because of the COVID uh, crisis. DBS was at the high was about $30. And because of the COVID, people worry about the lockdowns, business will be affected, and small SMEs will go bankrupt, and it will hurt the balance sheet of banks. So DBS crashed. And I bought 8,000 shares of DBS at average price $20.00. And 50 cents. My reasoning was that DBS, the book value was uh, $20, so I'm getting it at about one times book value. Historically, it trades uh, at about 1.2 times book value. So it only trades at a discount to book value during crisis like Asia financial crisis and global financial crisis. Right. So, I, so for 2020, I bought into DBS, and in 2021, uh, I sold off both my DBS and Popnex to take profit. Popnext, it went to $1, so I sold it and made a 100% return. DBS, it went to $30, I sold it and made a 50% return. But after I sold, it continued to go higher. Right. DBS went to $36, Popnext went to, I think, like $180, $2. Right. So the, another lesson we learned is we cannot predict the prices. Prices can continue to go even higher. We can never buy at the lows, we can never sell at the peak. As long as we make money, we are happy about it. So after I sold Popnext and DBS, I took the profits, I had a lot of cash. So what did I buy? I went to look at the Chinese market. Uh -huh. And that's where I end up with uh, buying Alibaba. Right. So people will know me as an Alibaba bull because I bought 13,000 shares of Alibaba in the Hong Kong market, right. all in Alibaba. 
Right. So um, just for those of you who don't know, uh, Master Leong actually do have a YouTube channel as well where he focuses a little bit more on the YouTube shorts and he actually provides some of the market updates within a very short span of time. So he uploads like one minute um, videos to, to tell you mostly about um, the different news and developments surrounding the companies. And he don't only talk about Alibaba, he covers um, quite a whole host of different topics as well. Currently, his entire portfolio just makes up of Alibaba, if I'm not wrong, right? Uh, so now my portfolio, I think 95% is uh, Alibaba shares right. and about 5% is the Hansen Tech ETF. So because I was too aggressive, I went 1.5 times leverage right. on Alibaba, too much conviction. And in the recent crash, I was uh, facing margin cost, so I had to reduce my Alibaba position. So now it's closer to about 10,000 shares of Alibaba. So I had to reduce my portfolio by about 25% like that. Right. But I'm still committed and high conviction on Alibaba. Right. Okay. So now we'll pivot over to, to, to the um, Alibaba specific conversations. So now what actually caught your attention or why Alibaba out of the few thousands of stocks in the entire market itself? Yeah, so I have been investing since 2008. So in 2014, I already saw Alibaba back then. It IPO at, I think, $68. Also, uh, on the first day, everybody was buying Alibaba. Because they say, wow, China, the economic miracle, the right. high growth. Yeah, Alibaba was growing at 50%, 40% high growth rate. Right. So the first day, it went up 30 40%, was bid up to $90 level. So in 2014, the Alibaba is actually the Tesla we are seeing today. 50% growth rate, a lot of hype. Everybody wants to go in and, and it's going to the moon. So right. it was a very hype up stock. But at 50 times earnings, I wouldn't buy because I'm a value investor. So I have not looked at Alibaba for many years already. Of course, okay. the valuations are just too high. Then uh, last year, uh, so in 2020, uh, late of the year, the crackdown or M Financial IPO was cancelled. So Alibaba from $300, it dropped to 240 mm -hmm. a 20% discount from its peak. So that was when I started to research more heavily into Alibaba again. So this is a blue chip company that I felt very comfortable because I understand the business and it was coming down. I tried to bargain on it. Right. So I started buying Alibaba at $240 level. Right. But it kept dropping lower and lower throughout the entire 2021. So all the way from 240, I buy all the way down to uh, 130. Then I went out of money. I even went on leverage that I couldn't buy anymore. Uh, so that's about it. Right. So um, this is uh, Master Leung's own um, investment journey thus far. So maybe then I wanted to ask you because you talk about the crackdowns in China, right? So China crackdown is not only specific to Alibaba. We look at all the big tech conglomerates like Tencent um, had their fair share of um, crackdowns as well. Then you look at Meituan currently also um, embroiled in some problems with um, profits and their take rate, etc. So why Alibaba out of all the different Chinese gems out there? You have your Tencent, you have your Meituan, you have your Xiaomi, your Jingdong, your Pintoto, etc. Why Alibaba? Yeah, so when I research in the Chinese market because of the crackdown, so not only I research Alibaba, of course I have to research all the different Chinese tech companies, understand the whole Chinese tech market, and then from there I bargain out and choose the best pick. So for like uh, Kuai So uh, and Meituan, I don't like them and I don't invest in them because they remain loss making. Right. Although the revenue growth rate they posted in the past very high, 50%, 100%. They do not have a track record of making earnings. So I felt that they were more risky. Then I look at JD and Ping Toto. Although they started to post earnings for one or two years, they don't have a long track record. Right. So I was also not that confident about them. Then lastly, my main focus is Alibaba and Tencent because they have been listed for quite some time. They have a five-year, ten-year track record of revenues growing higher and higher, earnings growing higher and higher, and their business model is not that difficult to understand. And also, I have friends that use their product. I've been to China. I understand what they are doing, and that's why I have more confidence in Alibaba and Tencent. So originally, I also bought into Tencent, right. but because Alibaba fell more than Tencent, I sold away Tencent to buy more Alibaba right. shares. Okay, understand. So um, from what I understand, um, clearly you are just fighting amongst the two titans, right? So you are just uh, uh, you have a core focus in Tencent versus Alibaba. Then you have um, both positions. Then at the end of the day, because of the price movement and how um, essentially, if you were to look at it, Alibaba is listed officially on the US exchange, while Tencent is over the counter. So it's easier for people to manipulate the price, and it's also easier when oh, there's China scares again. Then people will start selling out all their, their or they try to push down or or shots try to. To try to play around and manipulate the prices. So in, in this essence, in, in this case, right, 
how how then did you build or what was your journey in in terms of building conviction in Alibaba? Because you said that you started at two hundred and forty dollars, right? So I think at its lowest was at um, around seventy, sixty, seventy dollars. So that's around a price cut of at least um, two third, another sixty six percent from two hundred forty. So how then do you calm yourself down, or how do you even sleep at night? If I can ask. Yeah, so at all day, to have conviction, you must understand the business, understand the company, will it survive or not. Right. So in my past experience with the global financial crisis is I have seen companies going bankrupt and they are the smaller businesses which are over leveraged and they are unable to refinance their debt. So like in the Singapore context, in 2008, the TT International, a property builder, they were building a shopping mall beside the Jurong East MRT station. Halfway, the, the, they built halfway and the project went to a halt their cash flow run out. Well, of course, banks do not want to lend them money anymore due to the recession. So for a company, cash flow is like a blood flowing through the company. Without right. the blood, you will die. So when a recession comes or a crisis comes, the smaller companies, the banks might want to stop lending them money and they cannot uh, refinance their money. So they might declare bankrupt and be liquidated. So to to be a safer choice, I will prefer the blue chip companies. So Alibaba, the business model, I feel that is a cash giant. Uh, it generates a lot of cash, the balance sheet is solid, it has 60 to 70 billion dollars worth of cash. So even no matter how hard the recession, how hard the crash, Alibaba will not go bankrupt. Then the second piece of mind that I get is that Alibaba is a market leader in all four industries that it operates. E-commerce, they have a 40 over percent market share uh, against uh, JD and Pinkdoto. So Alicloud, they are also the market leader against Tencent and Huawei. Then uh, for their M Financial, it's basically a duopoly, uh, Zifu Bao and Weixing Fu Kuan, so Alipay and WeChat Pay. So, and lastly, the logistics, also a duopoly, Cai Miao and the Jingdong Logistics. These are the two uh, big logistics platforms. Uh. So, in all the four segments uh, that Alibaba operates, they are all the market leader. So, in basic business, uh, it's like, during a downturn, usually the smallest player will die first. The market leader will be the last one to die. So if my Alibaba from $70 drop to $0 and it go bankrupt, right, it means everyone else is already bankrupt. But right. I'm the last to die. If I die, then I die with you all. So that's my thinking. Yeah. Right. That's a very interesting take, by the way. And also, I, I wanted to echo that. Why one of the most important factor when, when I was looking into Alibaba as well was really its ability um, to outperform a lot of its um, peers, to be very frank. And if you to look at it, um, they're not competing in a space where there is no competition. A lot of people know that e-commerce is a lucrative industry. They know that cloud is a lucrative industry. And you have big heavyweight players, by the way. Tencent, Alibaba, they are just constantly playing proxy war, right? Um, Tencent, how they fight with Alibaba, they just invest in like Jingdong, Pintoto, etc, etc. So that's how they essentially try to take market share from from Alibaba and for those of you who have been following um, Tencent is essentially just flagging an all-out war um, whatever you, you whatever industry you go into I'm just going to invest in the competitor and that's how things have been playing out at least for the last 10-15 years lah. so maybe if you were to look at it um, it's true that um, currently out of the four industries pro probably they're all four, um, four industries that Alibaba is currently operating in um, they are market leaders but there are also a lot of um, known trends and facts right so Alibaba's e-commerce arm um, they started out at a 70 80% market share and then today they are at a 48, 49. If I'm being kind to them, I say that okay, they have half the market share, 50%. So that's a clear downtrend in terms of market share. That's one. And number two, if you were to look at um, some of the key metrics, right? Profits are coming down, um, free cash flow is being impacted. Then they started declaring a lot of like impairments on their, their balance sheet. So that, that is also why when we look at the Alibaba share price coming down, right? A lot of people are saying, yeah, the fundamentals of Alibaba is eroding. So you, they just quote you some of the numbers. You can see that, hey, there's a sharp drop, sharp decline. You can see that it's because of the crackdown, because of the penalty, because of the fine, whatever. Um, but that being said, if you're just a purely numbers guy, we compare, margins are also coming down. So how then do you evaluate? Or do you think, um, the, the, do you agree that the fundamentals are deteriorating? That's one. And number two, do you think um, um, it's a trend moving forward? Or do you think there's a turnaround behind this, this discussion? So the fundamentals have sh shift. So e-commerce right. now is more and more competitive. It's right. getting more matured. Right. The high growth stage is over already. So you must dig deeper to the numbers. But numbers is just numbers. You must see how the business is operating. So Alibaba, 
to fight against their competitors. They have new competitors now. So in the past, it's uh, Alibaba, Jingdong, and Pinduoduo. Now, Kuaizhou and the Douyin is also coming to steal the market share because the e-commerce is basically a big cake. And although uh, they are losing market share, the cake is getting bigger every year as right. people shop more online. So now, about half of the purchases are done online versus the shopping mall. And going forward, 60, 70, 80 percent of the purchases will be done online, and people will shop less physically. So the e-commerce cake will be bigger and everybody wants a bite and this cake. So right. quite so and Douyin, uh, they started as uh, short form videos but now they are doing live streamings. The influencers are getting smart. Not only they want to earn from advertising, they also want to sell products like healthcare products. La. The live streaming is a new competition. They will capture part of the e-commerce market share but they will not capture everything. Then for Alibaba, they are also fighting against the competitors. They are also going to live streaming. Then like Pinduoduo, they are attacking the tier 3 to tier 5 markets. So Alibaba counter by using Taobao Tezia, also means those big bulk discounted items. Mm. Uh, so those low quality, cheap price products. So Alibaba also went in. So like Meituan, they do the, the fresh food delivery. So instead of delivering food, they also deliver like your vegetables, your fruits, all this. So Alibaba also went in to fight against them by delivering groceries also from the Herma Sienzhen, which is the fresh hippo. Right. So whatever the competitors are doing, Alibaba also go in and fight. But the, what we are looking at the numbers now, the margins are compressing because of these new segments. Right. Uh, like live streaming, uh, like f uh, f groceries delivering and those lower tier markets, you are basically burning cash to capture market share. The margins are negative or ultra thin. That's why it's reflected in Alibaba, the weakness that we are looking now. But it's just them adapting to the competition. And eventually, since everyone is burning money, right? Like you see the JD recent quarter, they actually lost money. From right. profit making, they became loss making due to the competition. Then JD and Pinduoduo, they now, they are being separated from Tencent. Tencent uh, boss, uh, CCP doesn't like Tencent forming this kind of monopolies. Right. JD and Pinduoduo, they have to be independent. They cannot forever depend on Tencent to burn money. They have, instead of blindly burning money to capture market share, they will shift their model to improve their cost efficiencies, to deliver value to customer, right. customer satisfaction, to improve profit margins. Because gone are the days that they keep issuing new shares and blindly burn money. Right. Uh, so competition will ease down. Everybody will think of improving their system and how to create value. Right. So eventually, I believe margins will improve. Right. Just that this year, the economy will be still slow. So we have to be patient. Uh. One or two years later, uh, they will show earnings growth again. Like now, JD, Alibaba, Tencent, they are doing uh, cost cutting. They're cutting 10 to 15% of their staff. Also, uh, gone are the days of high growth. Now it's more of the harvesting stage, right. how to extract values uh, from the consumers. Yeah. So maybe just to add on a little bit on what Master Long has, has shared, right? I believe that uh, margins moving forward might not be as lucrative compared to um, um, the previous time when you're looking at 50-60% margin. Um, I think um, if you were to look at how Alibaba is intending to expand um, currently, they're really um, in part of this mode digging exercise, right? They want to expand their value proposition. They want to be in every single market. They want to do fresh produce. They want to do your normal e-commerce, your um, legitimate brands, etc. Et so, so this is really in this in their attempt to try to broaden their value proposition. And in this case, um, it's, it's a clear signal to JD and Pintoto as well that they, they, don't, they, they are probably not going to have an easy time, to be very, very honest. And it's also reflected in their earnings. Um, you, you can look at top line, even Pintoto is growing at what, 3%. And then JD, JD even though posing 20 plus percent, like what ML just um, shared as well, their bottom line actually took a hit and they went into loss making again. And this is clearly not sustainable, especially when they can't, it's not a good environment to be raising capital and to be just burning money as and when. Um, I, I would believe, I will fundamentally believe that they cannot outburn Alibaba 30 over billion free cash flow as well. So, so that's, that's really how we are looking at it now. But maybe to add on to what they've just shared, right? Now the issue with, with a lot of all these Chinese equities is um, they have pressures from all sides. So number one, your US-China tension, they're not going very well. Then they keep calling for delisting, um, calling for um, capital restrictions. Then now you even have, have worries about sanctions and, and whatever on China. That's the first point. And then on second point, you did agree, and I also actually do agree that fundamentals are shifting. 
I won't say that it's totally eroded, means that I won't say that, oh, Alibaba, suddenly everybody deletes the Alipay app or everybody deletes the Taobao app. I'm not saying that, but it's clear that um, they are trying to expand and there is they are in this um, very shaky times where they are looking towards um, trying to provide more value to the marketplace. So you see there, there are a lot of different factors that come into play, which is also why you see the share price collapsing like, like no tomorrow. Right. So, so in this in, in this way, right? How do you quantify each risk, or, or how do you put up a, a, a price on so many different problems? You know, today I see wow, problem A, problem B, problem C, and how how do you really make sense out of this entire um um, um development so far? Yeah. So there are a lot of problems, but these are a lot of them are short term problems. You must think long term, like five year, ten year. What will be the outlook of e-commerce? What will be the outlook of the China market? So I still believe that in the next ten years eventually China will overtake the US. Right. China will be the most biggest economy in the world and e-commerce will play a big part. So now US, the consumers, they are the biggest spender. So five years, ten years later, when the Chinese become even more rich, they will be spending more. They will be buying LV bag, uh, all those branded stuff from online and not physical shops. So the spending will eventually come although now the downturn is very slow. Then although there's a lot of competitions, the high growth stage is over, now the growth is actually more normalized. Oh, China is not growing at 8%, but they are still growing at 5%, which is still amazing. Slower growth, but it's still very good, solid growth. And with, with so many of those worries, we must have a good margin of safety. So if we look at Alibaba, I expect a forward earnings, I say they will make like $10 per share, say in, uh, in next year or, or, or so. So a uh, uh, price of one to all is only 12 time earnings. And you're paying 12 time earnings just for the core e-commerce business. Because the logistic business is loss making, it's not ref reflected in your earnings. Then the cloud business, the profit is just the beginning, just a small little profit. So it's also not reflected in the earnings. Then the end financial is also the same thing. So these three, they make up, is they show very little earnings, but these three have a lot of future potential. So basically, when you pay half time earnings for the free e-commerce business, you are getting M Financial, the 30% stake for free. You are getting Cai Niao, the 50% stake in Cai Niao for free. You are getting the Ali Cup for free. So uh, your upside is f actually from your bonus card, the three bonus. For example, if one day Alibaba becomes a multi-bagger, $300 to $500, it's not because of the e-commerce business. But e-commerce business, I say already, is matured. You will not get a big reward from the e-commerce business. Your reward should come from maybe a segment like AliCloud. AliCloud itself is growing at 30% and maybe even 40% as the Chinese economy digitalized. And in the future, AliCloud may even be bigger than the e-commerce business. So you have to look far. When you look far, far year, ahead, then you will see the true value of Alibaba. Yeah. Right. Thanks for sharing, ML. I think I actually do echo similar thoughts about um, um, the different discussions on how you look at Alibaba as a business. And I think more importantly, um, as we, we also can agree that, hey, um, Alibaba is currently at the maturing stage of the curve. This we have no doubt, um, especially the e-commerce business. But let's not forget um, why all these um, companies are called compounders, right? It's because of their ability to seek for new curve and to grow in the deal curve and, and to invest specifically. And I think I also wanted to point out something that's very um, not, not as... Uh, discussed um, aggressively in the online space, especially a lot of all these tech conglomerates, right? Why do they deserve a high multiple? Because of their huge network effect. They, they are not talking about selling you like even, okay, LVMH, it's a very good company. It's a luxury product company and um, their margins are insanely high because um, their cost is low. But the problem is they, they do have a distribution network, but they can't scale infinitely easy. The, the issue with, or, or the, I, I would say the, the plus point or, or really the bonus of all these tech companies, right, is the ability to scale is insane. And they have like billions of users. That's, that's incredible. You look at Facebook, they have 3 billion users. Um, Alibaba, is, is, it's going to be 1 billion by this end of the year. You look at companies like Amazon, you look at companies like Google, um, these are, are able to scale infinitely without um, very low cost. And I think this network effect, right, people always underestimate the power of all this network effect. I think even Tencent, um, people is not attributing a correct value to it because people don't understand the, the, the scale and the mass and the influence that they have. So this is probably just a little bit more discussion or uh, specific discussion surrounding the fundamentals of Alibaba. So now, um, let's pivot over to 
to, to the, the entire bear bull thesis, right? So today I'll be the bear of Alibaba and I'll be asking a few uh, commonly discussed questions, especially on like forums and, and, and on the YouTube space as well, where people are saying, everybody knows that Alibaba is undervalued. But what people cannot quantify or what people cannot understand is the risk of the Chinese government. So what's your take on it? Or how do you understand um, um, this entire idea of um, Chinese regulators or, or Chairman C, how they're going to crack down? Because we know that essentially uh, Ch the Chinese government risk, it's a known unknown. So we know that there's this risk, but we don't know what's the impact. We don't know what's the severity. We don't know how they're going to destroy all these companies. So how do you work with it? And what happens if the valuation continues staying low? Because investors don't know how to make sense of it. Yeah, in regards to valuation first, I think it's easier to explain. So Alibaba is now trading at a low P multiple, let's say like 12 times to 15 times earnings. So generally, historically, you look at big tech companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they usually trade at 20 to 30 times earnings. They command a premium, a high multiple because of their network effect. They have a very strong mode. They cannot be replaced easily. In, in fact, they are irreplaceable or they are just, just that solid. So Alibaba in the past, it also trade at the same 20 to 30 times multiple. Now it trades at a low multiple because of all the crackdown, the China delisting risk that makes investors uncomfortable. And yes, investors might remain uncomfortable for a long time. So it might stay at a PE ratio of 12 times for two or even three years. But it's okay for me. If the PE stays low and every year Alibaba can still grow its revenue and earnings at 10% clip, so 10% higher, EPS growth or from $9 earnings per share they go to uh, $10 earnings per share so from $10 earnings per share they go to $11 earnings per share so every year the stock price if it remains at 12 times earnings the stock price should go at 10% also eventually I believe there will be a revaluation of the P ratio but even if it stays at a low multiple at 12 or 15 times earnings is okay just be patient and it's, I'm okay with the low returns then for the regulatory crackdown right so we, we, we see that like the private uh, education totally wiped out. Right. Is that a right or wrong thing? So this is the most extreme part. So we just discussed this part. This part we have a good view already. Overnight, the whole sector wiped out. Right. So that was very controversial. Is that the right or the wrong thing to do? So that's a very big debate. So investors, shareholders will wipe out. So you invest in those uh, edu edu tech companies, you, you saw it drop 90% or even or become worthless. But we look at it from a fundamental point of view. Those young kids, primary school and secondary school kids in the China, previously they were spending seven days a week studying. Also, daytime they go to school, at night they must go for night tuition. They have no life. Seven days a week, morning to night, they were studying, and this is called nature, internal competition. So they have no meaning to life. They spend like 16 years of their childhood only studying. They don't play with their friends, and they don't enjoy their life. Now, after the crackdown, or Monday to Friday, they go and study. No more tuition. Weekend, they do dance, they do music, they do arts, they hang out with their family, they hang out with their friends. So this is more sustainable long, long term. So there's a work and a life, there's a study and a life balance. Previous, it was totally out of balance already. So what CCP is doing now is actually a rebalancing act. In the previously, uh, for CCP, every five years, they have a, a plan. So they have a five-year target plan. In their past, CCP was thinking, I want to overtake US. I want to pursue economic growth at all costs. So like, that is why Alibaba listed in the US, people were buying up the shares because of the 40-50% growth rate. But to get this kind of growth rate, the tech giants, they actually abuse the consumers. Like e they become monopolists and they take advantage of the consumers. That's why we are seeing such a high growth high growth at all costs. Then after the fire plan ended, CCP was satisfied with the economic growth, but they are unsatisfied with what is happening with the common folks. That's why they have this common prosperity team. It's actually more of a rebalancing act to reduce the power of these big tech giants and to give more benefits back to the consumers to make the common folks more happy and have a better life. That's my big view. Yeah. Right. So now if I were to challenge that, that view, right, and to look into this um, entire idea on 
um, because you, you started um, talking about what's right, what's wrong. And, and it's true. I think the entire environment for the kids in China, it's bad. And for those of you who don't know, there's a very good documentary out there dictating what's the average um, day in the life of a high school student. They essentially just study. When they wake up, they study. They, before they go to sleep, they study as well. So they study the whole day. And, and, and it's crazy and it's incredible. But then now, if, if, because as a shareholder of Alibaba, what if today they say that, hey, consumerism is bad. I think spending money as, as a normal folk is bad. So um, um, I, they, they want to discourage spending. They don't want people to, to continue spending money and, and to, be, to be consuming so much. Then they, they say that, okay, Alibaba, you can only go onto the platform maybe for half an hour a day. Or maybe um, they set a quantum or hard limit on the normal consumers. You can only spend $10,000 a year, for example. Then what's going to happen to us? And, and in this case, Technically speaking, if you have to look at it, hey, it's also good what, because um, you, uh, you, you cap the number of amount of money you can spend so that the, the population can save more money, they can prepare for retirement. So, so what's going to happen to us or what's going to happen to Alibaba in that case? Yeah, we can look at Tencent for example, because of all these regulations that they say, wow, no more private tutoring. Then also the online gaming, they actually basically stop minors from playing. Uh. There's so much restrictions for minor gaming. So uh, kids that below 16, they cannot use cash payment then they can only pay three hours uh, per day. So that restricts Tencent. And of course, their revenues are reflected. Right. Their uh, uh, local domestic uh, gaming revenues became flat. Right. Then their ad revenues also dropped because advertisers, they don't advertise tuition to the kids. They don't advertise gaming to the kids anymore. Right. So ad revenues plunge. So anytime CCP makes this kind of adjustment, there will be a short-term negative impact to these big tech giants. So how will Tencent adapt? Tencent adapt by, for their games, instead of targeting the minors, they're targeting the adults. They're targeting international audience. Then, uh, same thing for uh, Alibaba also. They will adapt and they will change their model. For example, now they are adapting their cloud. In basically, when Alicard and Tencent cloud, in the beginning, where do most of their customers come from? They come from the internet. Uh, companies about 80 percent of the revenues come from other internet uh, companies for right. example you, you do stop broking you use the futu which is mumu app who provides the cloud to futu is actually 10 cent cloud then you're using tire brokers who provide the uh, cloud to do uh, the trading because trading is very high volume you use any small firm necessarily high volume your whole trading platform crash you'll be liable so you must use someone that is big solid, reputable. So Tiger Broker uses Ali Cloud. Right. So in the beginning, they were focusing on capturing uh, revenues from this kind of big internet companies. But after the crackdown, a lot of internet companies, they suffered. So instead of getting business from them, they get business from other segments. So now, even consumer businesses, they are using cloud. So any crackdown on the tech giants, there will be short-term impact. But they are not tortoise. They are lions, hungry lions. They will evolve, they will become stronger, and they will look for other places to hunt and find profit and revenues. Right. Yeah. Actually, I also wanted to echo something that I haven't really been talking about as well. I think the, 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 the basic underlying assumption is always we think that, hey, um, the bigger political environment in, let's say, China, um, it's true. It's a very big uncertainty and a very big risk to a lot of all these tech companies because... Um, likewise, in the Chinese way of governing and the US way of governing, it's a little bit different. Um, they're a lot more effective, a lot more efficient, and when they say something, they're going to make sure that they're going to do it. But that being said, I think um, the very little merits are being attributed to the management team of the company. I think rather than looking at it um, solely from the government's perspective, oh, the government is going to do this, the government is going to do that, um, let's not forget and let's let's attribute some of the value of the company that you are buying to the management team's ability to adapt and also the ability to allocate capital. And I think like I want to add on to what ML has said also. Um, if you have to really look into the cloud business, initially there was a lot of um, private tutoring industry that all got cracked down as well. And a lot of all the revenue was all um, solicited from all these different um, high growth, high tech companies. And then after the crackdown, they quickly pivoted over to all the consumer, um, um, more focused on local based, government based um, industries. And that is just one of the multitude of different actions that they took. And um, we, we, of course, only time will tell whether they have the ability to pivot, um, whether they'll be the next Nokia, the next Yahoo. 
we don't know but I think um, we have to be comfortable with a lot of all this uncertainty because essentially we are placing a bet on the management team and also how the company is going to execute because it doesn't mean that you are in a good company or in a good industry there's circular tailwinds and stuff um, the company will still fail why? because the management team sucks so in this case um, we, we need to place more focus and emphasis on um, which also goes back to, to the idea that why do we want to pick companies with strong track record because it means that they have already exe- they have been executing for the last 10 20 years i'm sure it's not a, it's not a sure fire way it's not a guaranteed way saying that oh they are going to continue staying on for 10 20 years but at least you have something to look towards to and and give you a little bit more confidence in how they execute so this is just my two cents about um, um this entire idea so um, we did talk about a little bit more on the regulatory uncertainty and then we also did talk about um, the known unknown and valuation multiples staying low so now I, i'm going to read off a, a headline or maybe one some something that was that happened recently about Meituan. So Meituan was actually the first to experience quote unquote real crackdowns and there is a huge impact to its bottom line. So the NDRC which is the National Development and Reform Commission um, issued a policy directive to lower the fees and the commission charge by all the delivery platforms and are expected to reduce by about 5%. So this 5% by some analysts out there, they actually predicted a 25-27% to 27% drop in the food delivery business revenue, uh, specifically Meituan. But Alibaba was also in the entire um, disruption as well because they have the, 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 the food delivery platform, which is Erlama. But they only hold around a 20-30% market share. The majority is still dominated by Meituan. So you see, today, if um, they, they, they cited things like, oh, the economy is slowing down. They wanted to help small, business, small and medium enterprises. They don't want all this um, um, food... Uh, uh, food providers or all these um, restaurants to, to bear so much cost and then they say that okay today you lower your cost by 5% or you lower your take rate by 5% what if tomorrow they say that um, e-commerce um, you lower your take rate by 50% because it's too expensive for all the retailers so it's going to affect the bottom line um, let's, not, let's, not, let's not kid ourselves and um, the profit's going to be affected margins are going to be affected so how do you actually react to this news and, and what happens if really one day um, CCP says that oh um, e-commerce cannot, it's, it's too expensive, you're charging people too much money. How, how are you going to navigate this uncertainty? Yeah, so first we have to understand that China operates very differently from the like US and Singapore. So when the economy slows down, like we were hit by COVID, so lockdowns, how the US and Singapore economy and the government react, they hand out stimulus checks. Like in Singapore, businesses, they get rental rebates and for their wages, they get subsidies. In the US, they give free cash handout for consumers to spend. China doesn't give free handout. They don't take money from their coffer to give it to the consumers directly. They expect big businesses to be helping the economy, to do their part in the name of common prosperity. Right. So like for May Tuan and Erle May, they want these big businesses to take a short-term hit. So their profits will be hit for one year or two years during this recession. But in the long term, things will resume once the economy is vibrant again. CCP will lift off these restrictions and they will continue to make their profits. Then like for May Tuan and Erle May, the CCP don't like them because like to pursue growth at all costs, they did quite some evil things. For example, May Tuan, they are delivery drivers where they come from. They come from the tier 3, tier 4, tier 5 cities. They are the villagers with zero or no education. So they come to the tier 1 cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen to become a delivery driver because they can make 3,000 to 10,000 renminbi per month. But to make the fast money, they drive fast. The algorithm pushes them to make more deliveries, more efficient. So they overspeed. They make deliveries during the rain. Or do, when the conditions are bad, they still do the delivery because they need to make a living. So they don't have insurance coverage. By right, they should provide insurance coverage. Like if you are in the US, you have a union. So your delivery riders, if they have a heart attack and die, they are compensated. If they go into an accident and lose their leg, the company will make a payout. In China, to avoid this payout, Meituan don't directly hire the riders. They outsource it to a third party. The third party is basically a shell company. Uh, this shell company, they will hire maybe 100 delivery riders, ask them to sign a contract. Then you can now log into the Meituan app and you can rent the motorbike from us at a low price. You do your delivery and every month we will pay you out. So they, they are not covered by insurance. So if a lot of them get injured and they go and claim this shell company, right? the shell company will just declare bankrupt and close down. So Meituan cannot be touched no matter how abused the riders are. So 
CCP came down on Meituan is because they want to close the loophole. They want Meituan to be providing health benefits and a protection for these villagers, these tier 3, tier 5 city workers that sing sing ku ku, work so hard to exchange their life, their blood for the money to support their family. So this is also part of common prosperity. Of course, this is not fair to shareholders because last time I used the old method, I make so much money. Now I use the new method. Wow, oh, I must treat your delivery rider so good. It's hurting me and I'm making a loss. But this is the new model that is fair and that the delivery companies must adapt. And to adapt, that they are innovating through data to optimize costs. Like Meituan now, they are still loss making. But uh, in the past, they give a lot of incentive. Let's say you are a frequent user. Every day you order delivery. Your delivery cost is almost zero because they give you so much cash back, so much in incentive. Or they want you, those uh, high frequency users, to push up their revenues. But now they are cutting back on these incentives already. So for those high tier uh, frequent users, they will not give out so much bonuses, you will normalize and this will improve Meituan's margins and hopefully like one or two years time they will start becoming profitable. Yeah. Actually I wanted to go back to one of the discussion that you said right so especially okay now we understand that maybe the Chinese economy might be a little bit slow so they want big businesses to help out to help um, elevate some of these pressures and to maybe help out small medium businesses etc but then what if um, well, what makes you so confident that they will lift out all these restrictions? Because ultimately, you see, in this entire idea of common prosperity, right, they want the common folks to be the one benefiting. So in a way, um, if your normal people, normal men on the street, can pay lesser for their e-commerce because of um, lesser take rate, or if they can pay lesser because uh, my Meituan delivery is cheaper, so isn't it better for the entire country? Then why, what makes you so sure that, oh, um, um, the CCP will lift it all, all the different restrictions up again? So you must remember Jack Ma saying, and this is also the uh, Alibaba's culture, customer first, employees second, shareholder is last. Right. So I repeat again, uh, customers first, employees second, shareholders is the last. So it's same for the CCP. The common folks must be healthy, they must be happy, and they must prosper. So once the economy is strong, the common folks, they have proper jobs, they are being well taken care of, they will spend money, they will boost the economy, the economy will grow. Or then employees will have their jobs. CCP will not destroy Alibaba because Alibaba is paying billions of tax every year. They are cre creating millions of jobs. So Alibaba will live for 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years because it is contributing to the CCP from jobs and from taxes. We shareholders are the last to make a profit. The, so we must make to, in order for us to earn the, uh, the economy, the common folks must be taken care of. And this is my belief. Though. So once we get past this recession already, or this downturn already, or things will start to improve. Because CCP has to think of it long term, through their five-year five -year plan. This five-year plan, there will be a lot of adjustments, there will be a lot of crackdowns. But once everything stabilizes, the next five-year plan is very obvious to beat the US, to overtake US. How are they going to beat US and overtake US? By killing Alibaba and Tencent, you think they will overtake the US? Of course not. They need to depend on their tech giants to overtake the US. By say, let's say they want to fight in the Southeast Asian market. So like you do look at e-commerce uh, in uh, Singapore, Lazada, Shopee is dominated by China already. Amazon cannot even fight. So the CCP will want this change tech diet giants to prosper and to conquer the Asian market, the African market, the Latin American market, uh, and so on. So in the long term, CCP it is in their interest uh, to see the tech giants prosper and grow also. also uh. Just that short term, because the economy is bad, and in the name of common prosperity, we are feeling the pain. But I still believe it's short term. Yeah. Right. Um, since because I was the one that asked the question, right, and being a huge Alibaba boo, I have my own opinions as well. I think for those of you who have been following me for quite some time, you guys should know that um, I'm actually an advocate for creating value regardless of where you are at. So whether you're a shareholder, you're a company, or you're a common folk, at the end of the day, if you're investing in a company, if it um, uplifts people, it provides jobs, it creates value um, because in terms of convenience, in terms of allowing you to, to have more options, um, com competition, etc., 
um, whenever these different um, um, factors are being included into the entire equation, you can see that you that there will be shareholders' value because there'll be growth, there'll be revenue and stuff. And in terms of this entire rhetoric about saying, oh, um, um, the government is gonna tax everything, so they now they maybe have a 10, 20 percent um, um, tax rate, right? In future, if they want common prosperity, they're gonna tax you 50 percent or, or 80 percent or whatever ridiculous amount that you guys have. Um, let's not forget that um, China is not an isolated island and they know, um, they, they, I, I believe out of the whole suite of, uh, by the way, if you guys don't know, Chairman C and the entire CCP has a whole army of advisors. Their economic advisors is, is, is probably bigger than our Sing entire Singapore's parliament. So our, our Singapore's representative is not even enough um, to, 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 to make up their current economic advisors. And they, they do a lot of all this kind of cost-benefit analysis, what's the repercussions of their actions and stuff. They know in order for them to prosper and to be, to, to be one of the biggest economy, to be the biggest brother, big brother out there, um, they have to have a functioning capitalism. They need to attract capital. They need to um, retain um, all their talents. If not, if they're going to go down this route, everybody's, all, all the talent, um, a brain drain is going to happen, talents are going to flee, um, capital is going to flee, then I, I don't see how China is going to achieve their ultimate goal. So I always like to encourage people to think long term and to think what is in China's interest. Because we like to think that everyone else is, is, is interested in their own interests, only China is not interested. But maybe think again and, and think how China is supposed to position themselves, at least in the medium term, if you don't want to think that far out as well. So I think on the next part, um, there is also a lot of people complaining about the lack of transparency, the lack of rule of law in China and, and stuff like that. So um, can anyone really understand what is going on in China? And can really anyone um, believe the numbers coming out from all these Chinese companies or, or China government saying that, oh, last year, they even declared that in 2020, during the pandemic, they had a positive GDP growth rate. How, how do we even trust these numbers? Are they not just massaging or pulling the numbers out of their ass? Yeah, so fraud in China is very real. Like in the Singapore market, there has been as chips. Uh, there were a lot of scandals. Some companies, they turn out to be total fraud. All their accounting uh, earnings and profits are all fake. So there will be scandals. Even the US market, there has been a history of scandal like Enron. All the multi-billion energy companies turn out to be a fraud. So in the US market, listed Chinese companies like Luckin Coffee, TT, they turn out to be scandals and investors lost a lot of money. So for Luckin Coffee, they uh, boost up their revenues and earnings. So they are basically the Starbucks copycat. Right. So to make their numbers look good and to get a high IPO price to lure those US investors to pour billions of money into Luckin Coffee, they show high revenue, high earnings growth. But all these are made up. They have a lot of real physical stores, but their sales are not as impressive as they really are. So basically, they burn a lot of cash to sell coffee for almost free to juice up their numbers. So it turned out to be a fraud and the share price collapsed and it delisted and become an OTC. So there will be frauds in the market. But being 13 years in the market, how we identify fraud and what is real is through our market experience. Generally, new companies are easier to cheat the investors. It's easy to tell a lie for one year or two years. You want to tell a lie for 10 or 20 years, it's very difficult or you are a godlike liar. So have Alibaba been lying to us for 10, 20 years? If Jack Ma can lie for so long, so long and cook up the numbers for so long, I am very impressed. Uh. So I'm willing to let him cheat me. Uh. If Taobao, uh, Ali Kao, all this is fake uh, and can make this thing up for 10, 20 years, uh, oh, then I will clap for him. So he's the magician already. So I believe companies like Tencent and Alibaba, they are real. Their earnings are real because I have friends who use their product and uh, they are happy with their service. So the economy, the platform, I believe these are real. Then the Chinese economy, is it real or not? You go overseas, you see, wow, those Chinese tourists, they go to the LV shop, they say, huh? the, 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 the shop owner say, you want everything? Yes, <laughs> I want to buy everything and send back to China. They take out cold hard cash to buy. So cash is the real thing. Cash cannot be counterfeited, but they pay real cash to buy everything. So when you invest in the company, the earnings, is it real or not? You can cook up the earnings. Even the cash flow statement, you can cook up. But one thing you cannot cook up is dividends. Does Alibaba pay a dividend? They don't pay a dividend. But Tencent pays a dividend. This year, they paid a dividend of $1.60. 
So dividends is real. Because when Tencent pays you the cash, it goes into your bank account. And you use that cash, you can buy bubble tea, you can eat high tea lao. It is real kohak cash. It cannot be fake. Cash can never be fake. So Tencent maintains dividends at 160. But it's very generous considering they paid you a bonus share of JD shares. And you can take the JD shares and you sell. You can get an additional 3 or 4% dividend you. And that JD cash, the shares that you sell, the cash is real. You can go to Hai Di Lao and celebrate by selling your JD shares. I think Master Leung actually did cover quite extensively. Um, one of my main market metrics, especially for our foreign investors out there, who don't really have, have a touch or have a feel about the entire um, business itself, um, probably just ask any Chinese people that you know, um, specifically people from China, you just ask them to on their phone and then you check for two apps. The first app is called WeChat, the second app is called um, Alipay or Taobao. So these two are your, both tech, your, your two tech conglomerates and see whether um, real-time folks, um, locals, are they using those apps? And don't even talk about them. Even myself, if you open my phone, I have the Lazada app, I have the Taobao app. That's how infiltrated those apps are in our current day-to-day -day lives. And you can't make those numbers up. You can't make, make up that, oh, out of 10 people, you see 9 people have the app. Do you think it's fake? Do you think they don't use the app? Then, then why do they download the app in the first place? So that's, that's just my general takeaway and how I answer the question. So I, I, firstly, I have to apologize for the, the, the constant changing of background because the sun keeps chasing us out. So, so we'll just keep adjusting our position and, and try to hide ourselves under the shade. Lah. But anyways, then maybe the last question to just pivot um, over and to maybe uh, just a concluding statement from, from Master Leong yourself. Um, what is your deal breaker for Alibaba? So what needs to happen in order for you to sell Alibaba? Or there, are there any indicators or any trends that you look forward to? And like, let's say it's a checklist. The moment you hit three out of five of these factors, you're going to sell out. So what's your deal breaker of Alibaba? So to buy or sell a stock is all about price. You buy when it's undervalued and you sell when it's overvalued. Alibaba still remains very undervalued. So at the current price, I will never sell. But let's say some days, let's say the fundamentals is still the same, but the stock price goes up a lot. Then I might sell if I think Alibaba is fairly priced or overvalued and I take the money to buy something else. Or let's say uh, Alibaba could actually be delisted. Nobody, but not being forced to list it, but rather a cash buyout. So back uh, in Alibaba in 2008, they actually listed in the Hong Kong exchange or uh, pre-global financial crisis. Then the market crashed and the Alibaba shares went sideways for five years. So in 2012, Jack Ma made an offer and they took Alibaba private. They, he bought out all the shares and make it private because it was undervalued. And then in 2014, they released in the US market. So I won't, if say, I won't be surprised, you know. So what if CCP, they use a state-owned fund or Jack Ma comes back and they make an offer, let's say $150 or $180 to buy out all shares of Alibaba. Then I'll be happy to sell my shares and I'll take my money and buy the Hang Seng Tech ETF. And I'll buy Tencent, I'll buy something else that is uh, undervalued. So I will only move out of Alibaba if my hand is forced. If my hand is not forced, then I will remain calm as I know I already buying Alibaba, buy one get one, buy, buy one get three free. I'm getting so many great businesses for free. All the logistic business, the cloud business, and also the payment system. All this, so it remains very undervalued. And the fundamentals for such a big company, it doesn't change overnight. It changes slowly. And over a few months, and, and we, Every quarter, I'll look at the results and I'll monitor to see how the fundamental change. Uh, but I don't see any big drastic change. Like unless, like what you said just now, US and China they go crazy and they start the sanctions and start blocking each other. Uh, but I think the possibility is extremely low. Uh, maybe just one percent or less only. Right. Then we talk about fundamentals, right? So what has to happen fundamentally for you to sell out of Alibaba? So are there any key indicators they are looking at? So for example, maybe like, like I said, or in one of the previous discussion, right? We talk about um, CCP saying that the take rate of Alibaba is to be decreased by 50%. Would that be a move that you will sell out of Alibaba? So for example, now for every transaction, they are taking maybe 10% um, of the transaction volume. Yeah. Today, CCP say I kept you at 5%. Will you sell out of Alibaba? Oh, yeah. So like for one extreme example, let's say I told you like cloud is the, like Alibaba the big upside if it can become the multi-bagger is the cloud business. Let's say for example, CCP go crazy and say, your private enterprise cannot do cloud. We will nationalize cloud. 
everyone must move to the Guo Yun, uh, so the national cloud. So currently for the cloud business, uh, the top three players is Alibaba, Tencent, and Huawei. Alibaba, they mostly serve SME. Then Tencent, they mostly serve those uh, big companies, those enterprise, big enterprises. Then Huawei is the one that focuses on government contracts. So the state-owned banks, all this, they use Huawei. So they are already segmented already, and this has been very healthy. Then we look back at uh, Ali Cloud. You know that in the past, oh, it was the government that asked Alibaba to help them with the cloud, you know. It happened during both, uh, they have the Gao Tie, high speed railway. So when you want to book a ticket, the system always crash. You cannot buy the ticket because every time the ticket come out, there are a few hundred thousand of people trying to buy the ticket and the system always crash. That's why the railway system cannot function. So the CCP actually beg or request Jack Ma to save them. So Jack Ma sent their most elite team of uh, the Ali Cup and they took five days. And now the railway system is actually they are using Ali Cup. Not because Alibaba want to earn the contract. They don't make money from this contract. They are actually doing national service. They're doing this free for CCP to help them solve their the high speed railway, the congestion problem of their ticket sales. So they are so if one day I uh, CCP goes crazy and say, Oh, all your cup belong to me, I will nationalize it. Oh, then I will say, oh, I give up already. Then I will sell off of Alibaba. But I don't think it happened. Uh. If it happened, it will happen like five years ago already. Uh, now they do it, it's a bit it's, uh, weird. Uh. Like I say, uh, they need Alibaba cloud to dominate the world. They want all the data. The future is data. Now, AliCloud is the number four player in the world. Behind, uh, boss number one is Amazon Web Services. Number two is the Microsoft Azure. Number three is Google, Google Cloud. Uh. Alibaba is number four. Do Alibaba, do you think in CCP terms, do they want to nationalize the cloud and take away your, your Ali cloud and become theirs? Or do they want to see Alibaba cloud grow and overtake the US tech giants? So we go think about it. Yeah. Right, okay. So I think um, I think that's also one of the main concerns about other international investors, right? Always this tail end risk of what happens if everything gets nationalized. Um, the, the CCP takes everything back and, and then um, nothing is left for shareholders. Um, sure, there are definitely this possibility because if you look at end financials, I think it's also one where Jack Ma, um, a lot of people say that Jack Ma played um, um, Yahoo, which is one of the big shareholder and also SoftBank. But then we have to look at the nuances of the argument and not everything, oh, everything nationalized, nationalized. There's no, there's no upside. Um, like I said, we always have to play it strategically and look at the interests of the different parties. Um, I would like to think that a lot of us are all still interest driven. We are still very selfish being at the end of the day. And you need to weigh the pros and cons and, and make your own decision. We are not here to provide you any forms of advice or whatever. So I think it, it's very very nicely we come to the conclusion of this entire video. If you enjoyed, remember to smash the like button, subscribe if you haven't. Um, I'll leave the link to Master Leong's channel as well. I think he focused more on shots, um, YouTube shots specifically. And um, you can catch him out, um, I think, anywhere. Most of the time he posts um, in his Substack on his YouTube as well. So with that, I'll see you in the next video. More importantly, I'll see you on the moon. Goodbye.